We're here. Welcome to the first ever business and bourbon global virtual live event. I got to tell you guys, I am so excited for this and I hope that you're excited as well. Um, it, it took a lot of work to put this thing together behind the scenes. Before we get started, I want to shout out my squad. I've got five people here helping to produce this to make this awesome. And then we've got the seven amazing people that you guys showed up here to see. Not me. I'm just the dude that does the talking. You showed up to see them and I can't wait to, to present them and allow them to do their thing so you guys can, can get that tremendous value that they give and bring. All right. So a couple things I want to go over really quick before we get started. Um, we're going to kick this bad boy off with our whiskey tasting event. I'm going to shoot you guys all the way to Louisville, Kentucky for whiskey tasting going to be amazing. All right. Then we're going to head on to our distillery tour. We're going to mix in some great speakers. We're going to do some giveaways. We're going to have a good time. In fact, what? My staff is telling me that it is time for a giveaway right now. We're going to start this bad boy off with a giveaway. Um, what are we giving away first? What are we giving away first? Um, ah, Kathleen Denise Artistry. We're going to start there. So, um, we're going to go with the Kathleen Denise Arts. Hold on real quick. And I'm back. Custom bourbon glass. For those of you guys that have watched um, my day drinking podcast, you may have already seen some of seen seen my custom um, work of art here from Kathleen Denise Artist, um, Artistry. And um, this is a handmade bourbon glass. And she is, uh, gosh, she's such a tremendous artist. And uh, we're going to make sure and, and pop her stuff up there so you guys can can connect with her and, and, and make sure to support her. But we're going to give away a few of these today. Um, who's my first giveaway? We've got a little random um, virtual raffle. So all you guys that have had your tickets, you're already entered in it. So you don't have to do anything. Um, we'll call your name. My folks will reach out to you. And then you just send them your, your address. We'll be ready to rock. Okay. Who's my first winner? Jamal Boulder. Jamal Boulder, number one. You're the first one, my friend. Um, custom, beautiful piece of art, just like mine here. So you imagine. All right. So are we ready to go? We ready to shoot our folks off to Kentucky? Let's go. All right. Let's bring Richie in. All right. Hey, Ronald. How are you doing, bud? <laughs> Fantastic, my friend. Oh, I'd be a little bit better. You you're beating me on the bar, though. I feel like I feel a little inferior. Oh, <laughs> I've been collecting for a long time, so don't feel bad, buddy. It's beautiful. Thanks so much for joining today, Richie. Um, I'm gonna hand this bad boy over to you, guys. You are in fantastic hands. Again, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a great time today. So sit back. Make sure you get your drink. If you haven't downloaded the uh, Business and Bourbon Network app yet, please do that. That's how you're going to be able to collaborate with everyone that's part of the network and everyone that's going to be on the platform. Get your questions in. We'll be answering them live. We're going to have a great time. All right. We're ready to rock. I'm handing over to Richie. Virtual fist bump. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rodell. Okay, so thanks for joining me, everyone. My name is Richie Michaels. I'm the national brand ambassador for Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. So I'm going to be talking you through a, a tasting today. Um, so just to give you an idea of what we have laid out, um, if you want to do a tasting at home, here's some really uh, great items to, uh, to pick up before you start your tasting. Uh, so obviously, you need some of the world's best Tennessee whiskey ever. And that is the Uncle Nearest 1884 and the Uncle Nearest 1856. Uh, a few other items you'll need uh, to do your tasting. Uh, I printed out a tasting mat here with some information on it, but that's not 100% necessary. If you do want to uh, download an Uncle Nearest tasting mat, you can uh, uh, do that through our social media. Uh, also, you'll need some nice glassware to taste from. I'm using these Glen Can glasses. These are uh, industry standard for tasting, but you can use just a, a normal rocks glass, no problem at all. Uh, and then a few extra items I have up front here. You'll see in this first cup, I have some jelly beans. Uh, I'll tell you about those in just a second. In the second cup, some saltine crackers. And then the third cup just has some water. 
Um, you can use regular water. I'm using distilled water. Uh, that's best as it doesn't alter the, the flavor profile of the whiskey. Uh, so the first thing to understand when you're tasting whiskey uh, is how the process of taste works. Um, and it's actually done through your nose and not in your mouth with your taste buds. Uh, your taste buds can actually only pick up on areas of flavor, those being sweet, sour, uh, bitter, savory, and salty. The actual specifics of taste are done in your nose uh, by a gland called your olfactory bulb. It's located uh, at the top of your nasal cavity. Uh, so the way that tasting whiskey works uh, is that this glass of whiskey at room temperature is actually giving off a lot of molecules and those molecules will float up out of the glass, uh, go into your nose, connect with your olfactory bulb. And each time a molecule connects with your olfactory bulb, it sends a signal to your brain that is converted into a flavor and sometimes also an emotion. Uh, so the point of the jelly beans here, if you'll want to try this trick at a later date, is to show you how olfactory works. So like I said, your mouth, your taste buds can only pick up on areas of flavor, sweet, sour, bitter, savory, salty. The specifics are done in your nose by your olfactory bulb. So the way that we uh, prove that theory is that we close off our olfactory bulb, chew a jelly bean, and you'll only be able to pick up on that area of sweetness. Uh, on your taste buds, and then midway through chewing your jelly bean, release your nose. All of a sudden, all those molecules from the jelly bean can go up your nose, connect with the olfactory bulb, and you will be able to taste the specific flavor of the jelly bean. It's a really great experiment to show the importance of olfactory and the olfactory bulb in the tasting process. So um, the, uh, the two whiskeys we're tasting today are our flagship items. Uh, we do have a third whiskey as well. That's our 1820. Uh, but that is uh, our single barrel, um, really globally award winning whiskey uh, that is very hard to come by. So we'll just be uh, tasting through these two today. So we'll start with the 1884. This is our seven year old whiskey. So uh, we start with a, a, a recipe of 84 percent percent corn, 8% rye, and 8% malted barley. That's a very high corn content for your recipe, which is kind of traditional for Tennessee whiskey. Um, you have to be at least 51% corn in your recipe, uh, just like bourbon. Um, and then the rest of the grains can be whatever you choose. Uh, in Tennessee, it's very traditional to have a high corn content. Um, so 84% corn, 8% rye, 8% malted barley. And that recipe is true for both of our, our uh, whiskeys that we're tasting today. Uh, once we ferment those grains uh, and distill them, we then run them through what's called the Lincoln County process. And that is unique to Tennessee whiskey. Um, it doesn't eliminate us from being called bourbon. Uh, it just allows us to be called Tennessee whiskey. It's the unique process uh, that was given to Tennessee by the probably the most famous uh, I'm sorry, probably the most important uh, t Tennessee whiskey maker that you may never have heard of, and his name was Uncle Nearest Green. And so his technique was to filter the whiskey through charcoal made from sugar maple trees before putting it in the barrel to age. So once we use that linking process, we then put the whiskey into a barrel, a brand new charred oak barrel, and we let it sit in the warehouse uh, for at least seven years if it's going to become the 1884. Uh, once it's been aging for seven years, uh, we then use very small amount of, of barrels, very small batches. Uh, and so we mingle together about, uh, about 100 to 120 barrels at a time in each batch of the 1884. And that process is done by our master blender. Her name is Victoria Edie Butler. Uh, and on top of being our master blender, Victoria is also the great, great granddaughter of Nearest Green. She is fifth generation uh, in the Green family. Um, so we then let the whiskey age for seven years. Victoria uh, takes those barrels and blends them into a batch. We bring uh, the proof down uh, to 93 to go in the bottle. Uh, and then that's how we get this beautiful uh, award winning Uncle Nearest 1884 that we have here. So when you're tasting your whiskey, the first step that we want to do is we want to bring the, the glass up to a comfortable distance from our nose, uh, not too close that you're scorching your palate, but close enough where you can really sense all of these different molecules coming out of the whiskey, up your nose and connecting with your olfactory bulb. You want to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. 
There's really no limit to the amount of times you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Uh, all you're doing is every time you do that, you're allowing the possibility of more of the molecules that are in this glass to connect with your olfactory bulb and be converted uh, into a flavor. In any glass or whiskey, uh, you can have between uh, 200 and 350 different types of molecules in that glass. So that's 200 to 350 uh, different potential flavors that your olfactory bowl could pick up on. And so the next step in the tasting process, after you breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, is to take some of the whiskey in. And you want to take enough whiskey in where you feel confident that you can move it all around your mouth, uh, almost chew on the whiskey for 8, 10, 12, even 15 seconds, as long as you need to make sure that that whiskey hits every taste bud in your mouth, uh, not just on your tongue, but on the insides of your cheeks, your gums, your hard palate, your soft palate. Uh, you want to be able to hit every different type of taste bud that you have in your mouth, uh, the sweet, the sour, the bitter, the savory, and the salty. And so once you do that and you have the whiskey in your mouth, move it around, almost chewing it for 8, 10, 12 seconds, let it hit every taste bud. Uh, and then you want to swallow the whiskey. And after you swallow is the uh, arguably the most important step in the tasting process. Uh, and you really need to, after you swallow, consciously think about breathing out. Uh, I know we've all tasted whiskey before uh, or, or any distilled spirit and you, uh, you shoot it down and you have that, that nasty burn in your chest and it kind of ruins the whole tasting process. Well, that burn in your chest is actually caused by the, the vapor that is given off by the alcohol and not actually the liquid itself. Uh, so once you swallow the liquid, it goes down into your stomach uh, to avoid that burn in your test, to avoid ruining the tasting process, consciously make sure you breathe out after you swallow, breathe out all that vapor given off by the alcohol uh, so you don't ruin the tasting process. And then the last step in the tasting process um, is the finish. And the finish is just really a, a, a fancy term for where is my mouth tingling? So uh, when we say a whiskey has a, a forward palate finish, that means that the tingle in your mouth uh, is moving forward uh, as it progresses. Or if we say it has a back palate finish, the tingle will be moving backwards. Uh, or a full palate finish means that the tingle is moving in, in multiple directions as time goes by. Uh, so for our whiskey that we're trying today, the Uncle Nearest 1884 and 1856, uh, you'll notice that this has quite a forward palate finish. And that's because in our, our, our mouth, our taste buds that are more to the front of our tongue are more uh, uh, apt towards uh, sweetness. And we have a very high corn content, 84% corn. Uh, we also do some uh, processes in our aging that aid to the whiskey being a lot sweeter in the finished product. So you'll notice that we have a quite a forward palate finish uh, on our whiskey. So the 1884, uh, seven years old, 84% corn, 8% rye, 8% malted barley, blended by our master blender, Victoria E.D. Butler, uh, fifth generation nearest green descendant. Uh, the second whiskey we have here, I'll go through this quite quick. Oh, and sorry, between your whiskeys, uh, if you wanna use a cracker as a palate cleanser, uh, that is the best way to do it. Uh, a, a saltine cracker or an unsalted cracker is the best way to do it. Um, if you also want to add some water to your whiskey uh, to bring the proof down during the tasting process, that is absolutely fine too. Uh, I'm just using a straw to drop some in my 1884. Uh, and that will just alter the, uh, the kind of molecular uh, structure of the whiskey in the glass. And so those molecules will start moving out of the glass uh, in a different order. Uh, as the proof is down uh, and they will hit your olfactory in a different order and they will uh, alter the uh, perceived flavor profile of the whiskey. Um, so the second whiskey, our 1856, this is truly our flagship item. This is the whiskey that we started our company with uh, back in uh, July 17th of 2017. Uh, it's again, same recipe, same fermentation, same distillation. Uh, but with this one, uh, we, we also use the Lincoln County process uh, that was brought to us uh, through nearest green um, but for this one we let this age a lot longer so seven years for our 1884 the 1856 uh, we let these barrels sit between nine and 14 years the majority of, of the whiskey that we use uh, in the 1856 has been aged for for nine and ten years uh, but we do use barrels that are up to 14 years old the batches will be a little bit bigger with the 1856 uh, we might use about 200 barrels 
uh, per batch, which is still very, very small. To give you an idea, um, if you're uh, looking at some of your big brands, like your uh, your Woodford Reserves or, or your Knob Creeks, uh, they are going to use about 2,500 barrels uh, per batch, and we're using about, about 200 uh, in this batch and about 100 to 120 in this one. Uh, so again, as we taste this one through this one, it's going to be very sweet. Uh, and that's because of the, the charring that we use on the inside of our barrels and because of our recipe. Um, again, bring it up to your nose, in through your nose, out through your mouth. You'll immediately be able to see that this is a lot more complex. You'll be picking up a, a, a lot more flavors through your olfactory just by smelling. Uh, when you take some of the whiskey in, the first thing you'll notice uh, that it is more intense. This one is a lot more intense, and that's because it has a higher proof. This one's bottled at 93. This one is bottled at 100. But what is so significant about the 100 proof on this one is that when we take the whiskey out of the barrel uh, between uh, 9 and 14 years, uh, it's coming out of the barrel at uh, between 99 and 106 proof. And then we put it in the bottle at 100. Um, so this 100 proof whiskey that is in this bottle is actually only about two to three proof off of batch strength. So there is not a lot of water added to it before it goes in the bottle. So the intensity uh, is there. It's easy to pick up on almost immediately. Uh, the finish on the 1856 uh, will be a lot longer. Uh, you'll feel it moving more to the sides as well as to the front. Uh, the, the whole experience with drinking the 1856 is a lot more amplified. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful sip in whiskey. Um, it is absolutely our pride and joy, uh, the pride of joy of the nearest green distillery, uh, of Victoria Edie Butler, our master blender, of myself and of the state of Tennessee. So Ronell, I'll uh, hand it back over to you. Or I, are we ready to go to, to Victoria at the distillery now? Huh? Are we ready to to go what? up to Victoria? Oh no! I, I was just I was just getting my eighteen fifty six ready here. <laughs> <laughs> You're behind the ball, buddy. Hey, no break for me. All right, Richie, fantastic. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Great information. We're all super smarter for having heard it. Um, I learned a couple of things that I didn't know. Um, we want to move into. Uh, we're going to do another giveaway this time. So, Richie, you get to give it away because we're going to give away. One of Uncle Nearest's bottles. Uh, I think beautiful. The 1856. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful whiskey. Shelby's going to send you the name of our randomly selected person. Who is it? Randy Cooper. How do I send it to him? Hey, before before we do that, one thing I wanted to say really quick, guys, is I know when we kicked this this bad boy off, we had a couple of technical difficulties. Hey, that is what it is. Um, my 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 uh, team had a couple of glasses before we started. This kid didn't have any glasses. We just they, this is our first global event, as you guys know. We've done tons of live events in person, so the first global one had a couple of hiccups, but now it's moving super smooth. And we're and we had Richie do a fantastic. Uh, whiskey tasting, give you a fantastic experience. So now again, the winner, I guess I'm going to say it, Richie, because we we we're, we're, we can't figure out how to get it directly to you. <laughs> so, so our winner is... It's okay. Randy Cooper. My guy, Randy Cooper. 1856. Uncle Nearest. Away. Let's go ahead. Randy, and you are going to love it, my friend. <laughs> I, I'm, I was trying to love it, Richie, before you interrupted me. I thought if you could talk for another 10 minutes, I'm going to get into it. <laughs> hey, let's shoot out to Victoria. So we've got Victoria down at the distillery in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Let's bring her in. Victoria! <laughs> hey! We got a little. We got a little bit of a volume issue there. Let's make sure you're unmuted. There we go. We're, we'll wait. We'll wait. We still got. We a little tech. Hey guys, again, this is what's going to happen. Our very first business and bourbon global event. But trust me, hold tight. This is super worth it. Um, I we we shot you down to the distillery in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Um, Richie, you want to give a little bit of information about, about what's going on down there while Victoria gets some of this stuff worked out? 
Absolutely. So our uh, distillery is, is located in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Um, it's about 45 minutes southeast of, of Nashville. Um, it's a, a really great trip to, to go on if you're ever in the area because uh, you can actually go to the nearest green distillery uh, and the Jack Daniel distillery all in one trip. You have to drive literally past our distillery to get to theirs. Um, and uh, just through the history of our two companies and the way that our, our companies uh, were, were created, we have such an incredible bond, bond between us. Um, so it's, it's a really beautiful thing to do both of those, those distilleries in one day. Uh, so we actually opened our distillery for, for tours on September 5th of last year. Uh, but it's not fully operational yet. Um, we're hoping that we'll be producing our own whiskey uh, off of the still by the end of this year. Uh, but it's it, it's a very long process to, to build a distillery. It really yeah. is very complicated and, and, and difficult um, engineering wise, uh, structurally. It's it's uh, a, a big undertaking, uh, especially as we decided to purchase uh, an, a Tennessee walking horse farm for our distillery location. Uh, and so structurally, it, it, it took a, a lot of a lot of fixing and mending, which is going on every day as we speak. Yeah. Um, but the facility is is quite beautiful. Um, so we don't actually have any whiskey production or aging on the facility right now. Our whiskey is being uh, produced at another distillery uh, in Tennessee uh, and being aged in uh, warehouses in uh, Columbia, uh, Tennessee. So uh, so no, no, if you go today, you won't actually see any whiskey production. Uh, that won't be until until next year. Okay. Uh, but the it's absolutely worth the trip, though. It's really beautiful scene. We have uh, a tasting room, which hopefully Victoria can can show everyone around. Um, and uh, we also have a, a bar uh, on the property with makes amazing cocktails. And it's honestly one of the best places in the world to watch the sunset. Uh, it's quite spectacularly beautiful uh, on the horse farm with with all the horses around you with a cocktail in your hand it's it's pretty oh my amazing God, Richie. yeah I absolutely cannot <laughs> i cannot wait so um hey hey guys you get a chance once we get released from this global pandemic to get up there make sure you do um, i haven't been up there yet but it is the first thing on my one of the top things on my list as soon as we get released here i'm headed up there i'm gonna have a great time maybe ride some horses maybe i i don't know um there will be no pictures <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get on the horses either right now. It's, that's too much for me. So, uh, you know what we're going to do while Victoria's working through a couple of technical difficulties up there? I think we're going to run to our, we'll bring in one of our speakers, um, just move them up. So, guys, this is this is what we do. You know, Business of Bourbon is about entrepreneurship. It's about business. And entrepreneurship is is largely about um, rolling with the punches. So, you know, we, we have a couple of a uh, couple of hiccups. We keep it moving. We're going to have a good time. I hope you guys are enjoying a, a beautiful cocktail. Please share what you're drinking right now because we want to know. Share. We're going to post it up. I understand that we've got a question for Richie before we move to our speaker. What's that question, Shelby? We actually got a quick comment from the winner of the giveaway. Okay. Are we? Can we pop that on the screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. We got a comment, Richie, for you. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> this the uh, winner of the bottle. This is the guy that won the bottle. <laughs> he said, "This is not going to help me. I'm trying to pace myself tonight." No, All right. <laughs> you know that tasting whiskey is, is not as as simple as putting it in the glass and and, and shooting it down. It, it's actually a lot of science behind it. So, uh, Randy, I encourage you to um, practice tasting your whiskey at, um, with uh, with honor um and uh, responsibility so there we go there we go all right who, who, who are we bringing up next okay so richie i appreciate you my friend ronell thank you so much for having me on i will uh, I connect with victoria right now and we'll try and figure out those those technical difficulties so that everyone can see uh, our beautiful welcome center at our distillery Fantastic. Thank you again, my friend. Guys, hang in there. We're going to get Victoria on so she can tour you of the Welcome Center. It's beautiful. I've seen it virtually. Haven't been there live yet, but I intend to very soon. All right. So we're going to bring up our next speaker. We're going to bring up Mr. Ike Ikoku, my man. Let's bring Ike in real quick. What's Ike! up, Ronald? My guy. 
How are you? I'm doing well, my man. How are you doing? You, you're rolling with the punches, I see, man. Anything less would be uncivilized, brother. This is what we do. We, we got to give it to the people, man. Too many people have, have been waiting for this. And so, hey, we can't let a little technical difficulty slow us down. We keep it rolling. I got too many fantastic people like you ready to give the people what they want. So, Ike, my man, Mr. Ikoku, the stage Sir. is yours. Thank you so much, man. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the audience that you have pulled together for this first ever global business and bourbon. Brother, you are making history and you're bringing us on for the ride. I want to say thanks, man. That's incredible. So we've been hanging out for a minute. And one of the things that I know about Ronnell is when he pulls together an audience for an event, the people that tend to kind of follow him are really smart, really intelligent, really forward thinking kind of people, kind of folks that I love to hang out with. So my goal today is really pretty simple. I want to try to make a small contribution in up leveling the financial intelligence of the already brilliant people that are watching right now by speaking on the topic of how the financially savvy thrive through COVID-19 like financial storms and still manage to build more wealth than the average Joe. So to kick off our session today, we are actually going to start out by asking the audience a question. And so here's the question. The question is really pretty simple. Would you rather be the bank or would you rather be a customer of the bank? Now, here's how you can respond. If you'd rather be a customer of the bank, then just stay silent. Don't do anything at all. But if you'd rather be more like the bank, then here's what I want you to do. In the chat, hit us up with a smiley face, a thumbs up. Give some type of comment to let us know that you'd rather be like the bank. Yes. Financial intelligence, my favorite. Yeah, there goes the smiley faces. You see right now? You got a very, very financially savvy group of people. Listen, folks, it's not a trick question, right? I mean, of course, you'd rather be more like the bank. Why? Because it's more profitable and wealthier to be like the bank. Now, here's what I know. What I know is that financially intelligent people know that to win at the game of life and business, you've got to be very familiar with your balance sheet and your income statement. It's two statements that the bank pay close attention to. Now, in the COVID-19 world in which we live in right now, the focus and attention has shifted away from the income statement to the balance sheet. Why? Really pretty simple. Every business that you know is concerned about preserving assets, preserving their going concern. And so they are looking for all kinds of ways to access liquidity through the plethora of loans that you've been hearing about in the media. Likely you've heard about these SBA loans, right? They go to by the names of PPP and OPP and EIDL and everything under the sun. I mean, even Facebook has stepped up to the plate and they're offering like a hundred million dollars to try to help deal with the financial liquidity crisis that we're facing now in this country. So today, while you've got everybody looking for avenues to access liquidity, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you how you can tap into realms of liquidity that nobody is speaking about in the media. Now, I'm not gonna be able to uncork this entire thing during the 10 minutes that we have, but my promise to you is for those of you who like this topic and want to find out more, I'm going to tell you exactly how you can get more. So what I'm going to be unveiling to you is literally the exact playbook that all of the major banks are using. The exact playbook that the top 1% of the world's wealthiest families are using. And check that out. It's also the exact same playbook that companies like JCPenney, Disney, and even McDonald's used to start to grow and to save their fledging businesses during financially uncertain times, kind of like the ones we're facing right now in the midst of COVID-19. And here's the thing. Once the light bulb goes up in your head, you too will be able to literally unearth what I call the well-guarded secrets that you need to be able to leverage so that you can profit 
and build wealth just like the banks. So you end up being just like the bank and less like a customer of the bank. Now, here's the thing. I'm talking about profiting like the banks and building wealth like the banks. Like, what does that even look like? Like, how does that even show up? Well, one thing that I know is that there are a plethora of different ways that the banks do this. But one of the ways that I know that's very profitable to them is when they're able to leverage a relatively dormant asset and convert that dormant asset into an income producing asset, giving them access to enhance liquidity, finance, and wealth building opportunities. Now, here's the funny thing. The funny thing about all this is that you and I, <laughs> we sit on the opposite side of this transaction like daily and we're just completely oblivious to it. Here's how it goes down on a daily basis. So I'm a customer of the bank and I show up and I got money on deposit at the bank, but I need access to funds. I gotta get a loan. And so I talk to my banker who I've been banking with for 25 years and I go, yo, I need a loan. I need it in the form of a credit card. And they're like, you know, shaking me down, making me swear on my mother's grave and, you know, accessing all this information about me to make sure that I qualify for the loan. Finally, they're like, Mr. Ikoku, you qualify for the loan. And they go ahead and then they extend credit to me in the form of a credit card, at which I'm probably paying 16% interest. Now, here's the question. The credit extension, the money that they are giving to me vis-a-vis -vis that credit card, where are they actually getting those dollars from? Now, the answer is you, me, and everybody who's got money on deposit at the bank, right? And so here's another question. For the privilege to have your money on deposit parked at that bank at a place of safety, what are they paying you? It's like less than 1%. In most cases, it's like one-tenth of 1%. So check this out here. You guys have heard of OPM, other people's money, right? So the banks are essentially using other people's money, yours and mine, and they are loaning that out to other customers at the bank at 16% while only paying 1%. So here's the question. To build wealth, if you could make that 15% spread between the 16 and the one, do you think that that's a very lucrative way to build wealth? Of course it is. And you know what that's called in the world of finance? It's called creating arbitrage profits. It's the amount of wealth that you'll be able to generate by leveraging barred funds and putting that to a higher and more productive use. It's one of the secrets that I used when I went from being broke and bankrupt in 2003 to becoming financially independent in just five years in 2008. It's a concept that's routinely used by very, very financially savvy people. Now, here's another question. Due to what's called the, uh, the fractional reserve banking system, what the feds actually tell bankers is this. Every time that you initiate a transaction like that, where they take Ike's money in deposit, they take Ronell's money in deposit, they loan that out to anybody else that's a customer of the bank, they actually tell the bankers that you don't get to do that just once. You get to do that like 10 times over. So put yourself in the shoes of the banks. If you, in a time of liquidity crisis, didn't have to go through the shakedown that the banks put you through and have you wait three or four months before you get approved for a loan, but you could get instant access to your funds, put that to a higher and productive use where maybe you're now creating the spread and creating arbitrage profits, but you not only could do it once, you could do that multiple times. Would that help accelerate the level of wealth that you're able to create? Here's an opportunity for some feedback, guys. What do you think? Again, if you think it doesn't help you, say nothing. If you feel like it could help exponentially increase the amount of wealth that you create for yourself, and hit me up with some comments, some likes, some reactions, anything to register your vote right now. I see Paulette giving us a nice smiley face. That's definitely the way to go, right? So this is and in, yeah, Frankie baby showing up. I hear you, chair. Love it, love it. You guys, again, are very, very, very smart. This is a great audience we have. It's an incredible way to build wealth. So here's the thing. 
In my course that I created, I actually expose this and several other topics that allowed me to go from broke and bankrupt to literally building a seven-figure net worth to being financially independent at the tender age of 34 in 2008. Now, in an age where we are faced with an incredible liquidity crisis, the question you have to ask yourself is this. If there were alternate places where you could park your money, still have the same measure of safety that you have at the local bank, but now unearth just crazy opportunities for you to be liquid in a moment's notice, but to also take advantage of the opportunities as they show up in the season of the economy that we're in, would that be beneficial? Because everything you hear in the news right now talks about it's unprecedented what's taken on what's happening right now. The number of people that are unemployed, the number of businesses that are going out of business, what nobody is talking about is the unprecedented level of wealth that's going to be created right now in the midst of the financial storm. And so if you want to up-level your financial intelligence and learn how to access that teaching, I put together a free webinar for you. I'm going to drop a link right into the comments and you guys will have an opportunity to check that. It's going to be 90 minutes of pure gold. And if after you check that out, you feel like, man, I need to figure out a way to put this in place. I've got an entire course that I put together for you. And for probably less than what you spend on lunch for about 100 days out of the year, you could get access to that. So again, I'm going to drop that link in the comments for you guys. I hope it's going to serve you at this stage of where you're at in your wealth building initiative. And folks, my time is just about up. I hope this has been of great value to you. Again, give it up to my man, Ronnell Richards. Nobody puts on an event like my man, Ronnell does. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to turn it over to the man of the, the hour, our MC, Mr. Fantastic. Uh -huh. fantastic. <laughs> I, fantastic. I hope you guys are energized from that. Like That's what it's about. We need to take this seeing what looks like an obstacle we got to change the narrative on this bad boy man like let's 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 thrive and that's what i love about your message ike it's about let's not let's not just survive this thing let's thrive let's come out of this better off than we were before all right thanks my man appreciate you keeping it moving as we keep moving it's gift time i got to give out i got so many gifts here i got to keep kick, kicking them out okay i got a t-shirt who are we sending this to to Mark Shepard. Mark Shepard. I know Mark. She I know all of y'all. We're all family on this bad boy. Mark Shepard. Okay. Boom. That's for Mark. So we've got Victoria back, guys. And I believe that our, our technical difficulties are worked out. The sound should be good to go over there. Um, just want to set you guys up, let you know what we're, we're how we're going to keep this bad boy moving. We're going to move into Victoria. Um, after that, we've got a a couple of uh, words from from a couple of our sponsors. We're going to head into another speaker. We're going to head into our Q and A. It's going to be a ton of fun. A um, couple of things that my folks are telling me that I need to tell you. Oh yeah, the app. So if you guys aren't logged into the app, please log into the app. Download the app. Um, when you got your ticket, you've probably received like three or four emails from either me or my staff with the link to download the app. So download the app. Why do I want you to download that? So you can interact. All right. Business and bourbon is more than just people talking at you. This is about the network. This is about the fam. This is why I bring such these, these great um, thought leaders and business professionals to the platform so that we can grow as a family. So I want you guys, once this thing is over, to continue these relationships, build some relationships, do some business with these folks. So it starts on the network. So make sure you download that and pop your questions because when we get to the Q&A, we're going to use your questions live because we want to talk about what you want to talk about, what matters to you. All right, let's bring Victoria in. Hello. Yes. <laughs> I Victoria. am so, I'm sorry, Ronald. I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's so, you know what, Victoria? I think maybe you were mixing a couple of barrels back there and maybe a little <laughs> bit of it into a glass. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're all good. We are so stoked and so excited to, to have you take us on a little tour uh, of, of your new facility. I, I wish I could be there in person. I can't wait to get up there in person. When I do, I'm going to expect, you know, you're going to have the glass ready for me, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So you can hear me. You can hear me well. We can hear you fantastic. Okay, so, very good. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and we'll get keep this party moving. We're good to go. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Did Richie go into who nearest green is and, and how this started? You. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everybody. I apologize for being late. Uh, it certainly wasn't my intention. I was having technical difficulties, so I won't take up as much time as I had intended the time that Ronnell had graciously given me. But I would like to tell you a little bit about um, what's going on here. Uh, I'm sure Richie already told you, my name is Victoria Butler and I am the master blender here at the Nearest Green Distillery. I am fifth generation um, uh, Nearest Green descendant. And uh, I have the awesome honor and privilege of being the creator, the curator rather, of the first bottle of our awesome 1884. So you had an uh, opportunity to taste that already this evening, so I won't go into that. But um, I just want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you for a little bit. I bring you greetings from the beautiful uh, Nearest Green Distillery. I am sitting in our uh, welcome house. This is where the visitors come um, for tours on the weekend. And this is where we greet them. And this is where it starts. We go from here out into our beautiful um, acreage here in Shelbyville, Tennessee. The distillery sits on approximately 270 acres of beautiful Tennessee land. Um, right now we are under construction. Uh, the, the facility I'm sitting in now, it, again, it's our welcome house and uh, it is completely finished. Uh, behind the welcome house is where our executive offices are. And um, unfortunately, I am talking to you from my laptop, so I can't actually do a, a tour tour. So I'm just going to tell you what, what's taking place here. Um, next spring, we will open our, um, our permanent visitor center, our permanent uh, visitor center, and it is called Heritage Hall. That is where we will honor all things Tennessee, including uh, our awesome whiskey. Uh, the man's name, um, the man who we honor, of course, is Nearest Green. Uh, Nearest Green is the slave who taught Jack Daniel how to make whiskey. We believe that Nearest was born in 1856, which is, um, why we have the 1856 bottle that you also tasted this evening. Um, it is in um, his honor, of course, that we do all things here at the, at the distillery. We believe that Nears was born in Maryland and later came to Tennessee and worked on the Dan Call farm. Um, that farm now belongs to us, to the distillery, our awesome uh, co-founders Fawn and Keith Weaver and Fawn Weaver is our CEO they purchased the house on the bottle and that is the Dan Call farm and that is where Nears Green um, distilled whiskey and that is where he met Jack Daniel um, again it was it's called the Dan Call farm Nears Green worked there uh, Jack Daniel came there as a young lad and he too uh, worked there on the Dan Call farm as a chore boy. And later, um, as time went on, uh, Jack became curious about what was going on with all the smoke and the noise that was going on uh, in the holla a distance from the main house. And so Dan Call finally consented, gave in and took Jack to meet Nears. And there, um, is where um, their friendship and their relationship began. Uh, Jack became, um, under, Nearest became Jack's mentor. And uh, when Dan, Dan Call introduced Jack to, to Nearest Green, he told him that he was introducing him to the best whiskey maker he knew. And um, so from that, 
their relation, relationship grew. And um, when nearest last foot bought uh, whiskey in a barrel, which we believe to be in um, 1884, and that is why that number is significant on our bottle. Um, Nears retired and his grandson and sons took over. And so the relationship with, with them continued. So in a time where it was unheard of for a white man to be friends with a black man who was first a slave and then of course a, a free man, um, their relationship was unconventional to say the least. And so now we have the opportunity uh, to continue that beautiful spirit of friendship that Jet Daniel and Nearest Green started. Um, we uh, do everything we do here at the Nearest Green Distillery with love, honor, and respect. And uh, we hope that that flows over to everyone who comes to visit us here at the Nearest Green Distillery. Um, we opened last September 5th, and we did that with an outstanding celebration here on the property. We had over 3,000 people come to join us as we celebrated, celebrated our phase one opening. And um, we had hoped to do that again uh, this year with phase two, but given the state of, of life these days with, with the COVID-19, we're unsure at this point if that's gonna happen. But I hope uh, to have the opportunity to uh, meet and greet each and every one of you who are on this live stream this evening. I hope to, to have the opportunity to meet and greet you here at the uh, Near Screen Distillery someday. I hope that you come to our often off our awesome facility and um, take a tour. Uh, right now we are open, well, not right now because of COVID-19, but before everything happened, um, our tours are on the weekend, on Saturday and Sunday. And um, I'm typically here on Sunday when I'm not tra traveling. And if I know someone in particular is coming, if someone has reached out to me and, and wants me to, to meet them there, I try to do that as well. So if you ever have the opportunity to come to Shelbyville, Tennessee, or in close proximity to Shelbyville, Tennessee, please come and visit with us. I'd love to meet you. I love to show you around this beautiful property. I love to uh, talk with you and uh, tell you more about Near Screen and uh, his relationship to Jack Daniel. I love to tell you more about um, the, the filtration process that Near Screen started that uh, now all Tennessee whiskey has to go through to be called Tennessee whiskey. Um, given the time that, that uh, we have this evening, I won't go into everything, but I do wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. And again, I welcome you to come visit us whenever you're in this area. And I'll flip it back to Ronell. There it is. Victoria, thank you so much for sharing that beautiful story. And uh, I, on a personal note, it was so important to me to have Uncle Nearest be part of this event because um, I love the story. Um, I am I, I tell the story to everyone that I meet when I'm you know when we're talking about whiskey because I think it's it's one of those those super important little, little known American history facts that people just don't know but they need to know. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to share it. Appreciate you working through the tech issues with us. And when I come up there, all I ask is that my glass is neat. You don't need to, I don't need nothing <laughs> open, okay? Well, I can handle that. And and if the opportunity presents itself, um, I love to come back um, and talk with you guys more. Uh, I know that you have other things going on this evening, so I wanted to be respectful of the time, but I would love to come back and, and talk to your to your audience again. Thank but I want to thank much. you for the opportunity. It's it's always an honor and a privilege to share the story of Near Screen. Um, it is uh, awesome to be walking in my passion and 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 
carrying out my great great grandfather's legacy. So thank you again for the opportunity, Ronnell. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Victoria. You guys can make sure to get onto the website. The link has been scrolling. If you want to buy a bottle, buy it. See you soon, Victoria. All right, we're going to keep this bad boy moving. So right next, guys, we're going to hear something really quick from a couple of our sponsors, and we're going to start to move into our, our panel Q&A. Uh, I know that's what you guys showed up for, right? But we've got some partners that, before I move into the partners, I want to tell you why we partnered with these specific companies. We're in this virtual world, right? So I made... I was very, very intentional in making sure that we brought in some companies that have tools that you guys can use right now to be successful in your business and to help this transition that we're all making. So um, we're going to hop right into it. So next up, I have Nextiva and I've got Catherine with, with Nextiva, who I love. Love you, Catherine. Let's bring Catherine in. Hello. Cheers. Woo! What are you drinking? <laughs> I have E.H. Taylor. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You could have invited me to a better event. Whiskey and money. Let's talk. Yes. And and guys, let's let's wish Catherine a quick ha happy birthday because her birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, Catherine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give the floor to you for a couple of minutes and tell folks about Next Diva. Yeah, I don't really know how I follow up to money and whiskey. But I'm going to try. Uh, so I represent Nextiva. We're so pleased to be here. Thank you so much, Ronell, for the invite. We are a communications company, and we provide communication solutions for all companies of all sizes. And especially due to COVID, communication is changing as a whole, the way we communicate, the types of communication that applies. So Nextiva supports voice, text, chat, email, really all the different types of communication that you have as a company with your consumer base. And so we'd be happy to support you in your endeavors to make sure that your company or your customer base can communicate with you in any preference choice they might have and to really bring you into the millennial when it comes to uh, automated services, self-service, contact center, all, all types of fun things that you can do with your business to make yourselves more efficient from a communication standpoint. So again, Ronnell, thank you for having me. I know we're a little short on time, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. The happy birthday was just a bonus, uh, but thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and continue drinking my whiskey. Thank you so much, Catherine. And again, happy birthday to you. Uh, it looks like you're getting started a little bit early with the... <laughs> <laughs> which is cool. I love that. Hey, guys, we're going to start to head into our, our question and answer here with our panel. Here's how we're going to break this up just so you guys kind of understand the way that this is going to flow. Um, again, all the questions are fed from you guys. So some of you guys have already submitted questions through the app over the, the last several days. Thank you for that because you're going to be first up. So we're going to pull from your questions for our panel. Um, and then we will we'll have a, a brief break. We're going to bring in another one of our speakers. Um, and we'll finish it up and then we'll bring in another one of our speakers as well. So hang in there, guys. It's going to be a fantastic time. Uh, I, I, again, want to know what you are drinking. I don't care what it is. All right. It's not about the whiskey. If you're enjoying some kombucha, fantastic. <laughs> Enjoy some kombucha. Share with us what you're drinking. Let's have a good time. All right. I'm ready to bring my folks in. I believe my guys are giving our, so, so guys, so you know what's going on here. We have, I have five people behind the scenes here. So if you get on Instagram, look at Instagram Live, you'll see the kind of the behind the scenes of how this whole thing works. So thank you guys for supporting me. All right, let's start introducing people. First and foremost, let's bring Mary Henderson in here. <laughs> Mary! How are you, Ronnell? <laughs> hey, you promised me a mimosa, didn't you? I know it's early in, in, in Australia, but uh, oh, mimosa no, or at least no, Irish no, coffee? No, no, no. Water. That's about as, as as if I had mimosa. Do you realize that I will be just? You know, my energy levels are up here, right? Could you imagine me yeah. and mimosa at seven thirty in the morning? I'll be up here, and I've got another not, live show in six hours. <laughs> not only can I imagine it, I was looking forward to it. Dang! <laughs> Let's bring that, Nick in. That has to be real life. Nick Nelson, the What's brand renewer, looking so cool. How are you doing, no, sir? No, you know what? Take Nick out because Nick Nick is looking too cool. I got to be the coolest guy on this. Nick, Nick, you got to go. We gotta Get him out. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ronnie, I'll be quiet for a second. Mary, hello. How are you? 
How are you, beautiful Nick? I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you are my brand crush. I just need you to understand that, okay? <laughs> Ronnell, Ronnell, clo clo close your ears that. for a second. Close your ears for a second. You close my ears. Crush. Okay, everyone, close their ears. I don't. I, this, my, this, this, I we have we have children watching this, Nick. Look deep okay. Into my eyes, Mary. You are my brand crush. I'm looking at you, baby. Let me tell you. I'm Ooh, like, she said, baby. You hear me? I'm, pr All I'm right. present. All right. Keep it moving. Bring Josh into this. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know if I belong on this right now. <laughs> no, Josh, you do. I've heard it. Like, the love that you and you and Nick have for, for Mary. I don't <laughs> Hold on. Virtual. Ryan, it's something about Mary, okay? <laughs> Obviously. What's yeah. going on, Josh? How are you, my man? Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. We are very excited to have you. So let's bring let's bring in my the the, the our, our last uh, Mary crush here, uh, Frank. Frank, what's up? What up? You know I love me some Mary. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's All right, is it pronounced Favre or Fabre? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Now, someone out there got that. Farber Fabre. Okay. All right. Yeah, Welcome, yeah. guys. So excited to have you guys on the platform. So excited to kick off this Q&A. Before we do it, we're going to go kind of around the horn real quick and just introduce yourselves. Although everyone knows who you guys are. Just for that one or two people that just popped on that just might not know, let's tell them who you are. Mary. Well, I'm Mary Henderson. I live in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so that's why I have a very weird accent. Um, and I commercialize personal brands and work with uh, coaches, consultants uh, to digitalize their uh, knowledge and um, and build uh, build their brand into an authority. That's what I do. Thank you very much. And you're drinking water, which is okay. all good. It's yeah. super early. Nick. <laughs> My name is Nick Nelson or Nick F. Nelson. They call me Brandpreneur, and I have a company by the name of Brandpreneur. I help remarkable people, products, and organizations get noticed and do that by enhancing their professional reputation online, leveraging social media, because <clears throat> most people are voyeurs. They don't say a word. They don't allow their greatness to be seen online. And so I fuss you into greatness, and I am on Kettle One. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Kettle one, no more Tito's, huh? Okay. <laughs> okay, we 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 you drink what you got. There you go. <laughs> it's quarantining. That's what we're quarantining. <laughs> Frank, what's going on, my man? What's up, everyone? Uh, really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. My name is Frank Mangert. Um from New Haven, Connecticut, uh, originally from Hollywood, Florida. I am drinking. Fisher's Island lemonade. Uh, it has whiskey in it. Uh, okay. <laughs> and if you don't know, now you know. Now you know, baby. Okay. I run uh, a company called EBM. We're a HR technology firm. We work all across the nation. We put time back in HR professionals' days. But my mission is to be the change in the world. Uh, every day I wake up inspired to be a better version of myself. And I am out here to, to build a tribe and people who are like-minded, who, who really want to make a change in the world and be the change. That's what's up. That's what's up. Josh. What's up, man? All right. So originally from New York City, currently in Silicon Valley, moving to Austin, Texas. Let's uh, just get that out of the way. Nice. Um, so Where what do I do? I work with Fortune 500 companies, uh, specifically coaching emerging and senior leaders. And I really work on enhancing their skill set, their mindset, um, and their performance so they can lead with purpose across the country, across the organization. That's what I do. Love it. Rock stars. Oh, my God. I'm feeling a little bit insecure, guys. That's why I had to dress up, you know. <laughs> Got these rock stars on, on the platform. So I had to make look like I belong, you know, because I'm feeling like, a, again, insecure. All right. We're going to hop straight into the questions because this isn't about us. And that's why I wanted you guys. I, first of all, I love every single person. Every single one of you guys are, are fantastic. And thank you for heeding the call when I did my Lionel Thundercat thing. Y'all showed up. And I appreciate that. But this isn't about us. This is about the people. This is about the people that we serve. And so we're going to hop straight into the questions. All these questions come from um, submissions over the Business and Bourbon Network. Guys, if you haven't downloaded it yet, please do so. Okay. Download it. 
and make sure that you are collaborating and that you take this thing offline because all of us that are on this thing, we're all about taking these online relationships offline, right? We've got Mary from, from Melbourne. Did I say that right? Melbourne. Yeah. Melbourne. <laughs> See? Ah, all right. I pride myself on that. All right. On to the questions. First question. And this comes from Asandi Connor. I like that name. She's one of mine. She's one of mine. She's one. Well, now she's one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Asandi says, what gift or unexpected blessing has the pandemic afforded you as a leader? Ooh, good question. Let me take that one. Go ahead, Nick. What it's done is it's allowed me to sit my brand self down and really think bigger. Um, one of the things that I look at in terms of just sometimes we get so used, Ronnell, to doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation with Mary about this at least about a week ago. And I said that um, sometimes as entrepreneurs, we, we solve a problem, but it's not the bigger problem. And there's a bigger problem to solve. But we're so used to the rat race of being here and there, et cetera. And we, we, we lean into what we know. What this caused me specifically to do is to just be still. Mm -hmm. And to say, OK, what problem am I solving now? And any person who is an entrepreneur, um, if you're a business person, if you're not solving a problem, then you're not in business. Right. And so the problem that you saw prior to March 13 is not the same problem that many of us are solving today. And so what it allowed me to do was to just get in my closet and say, OK, this is the problem that I'm solving now. This is a bigger problem. And then now let me pivot. Let me shift. Let me move in a direction that allows me to to still service and do what I do, but do it differently. So it just allowed me to think differently. I love that. So so I, I want to kick this. In. I want I want Frank, I want you to answer this question, too, because, you know, all of us that are on here, we've all had you know lots of employees. We've all run run companies and had lots of employees. But most of us don't do that anymore. Right. Like we have people that work for us, but not like we did over, you know, in years past. Um, you have staff. Right. You've got a lot of a lot of people that uh, work for your company. So I, I want to kick this question to you. Um, and as, as, as a leader of your your company, like what what's been the underlying blessing? What what has happened with with you folks up there in New Haven? Well, I'll tell you, yeah, it's it's having a staff uh, and having a lot of people that you, we're, we're a culture driven company. Uh, so going into the office, uh, even though we had work from home prior, going into the office every day, you, you get to vibe with people. We build off each other. And I think there's a part of that 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 everyone misses. But we, we didn't miss a beat. Uh, I think we've always led uh, in, a, in an environment where we put our clients in high priority. So empathy, things like that, nothing, nothing really changed for us as far as how we treat our clients. It's, it's always been the same. Uh, but I think adapting to not being around each other all the time as a team has been, been you know, something that uh, I think we've adjusted to very well. Mm -hmm. and, and communication is, is top of mind all, all the time. So we've been making use of video chat. And, and other methods to just make sure we're vibing together and keeping it going. It, now, Asani also had a follow-up question that I want I want to kick to Mary and, and, and Josh because, uh, Mary, you're the coach of coaches. Like, you're the one that I go to and you give me – you you lead us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, Josh, you're leading big-time corporate leaders out there in Silicon Valley. So, like – the question that Asandi had is, how do you stay motivated in the midst of this emotionally, financially, physically and spirit? Whoa, that's big. Physically and spiritually disruptive season. Right. Because um, and I know that I, I want to kick this to you guys because you're dealing with more leaders in business that are that are challenged with this and you got to fuel them up. So, Mary, what do you got to say? Well, I'm, I think for me, it's, it, well, fortunately, it's business as usual for me. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that um, it, staying motivated is a really important aspect of what I do. I actually have no choice. I have to be motivated. Mm -hmm. And because I live in my creative head most of the time anyway, you know, I have to actually, um, 
you know, I've got to ask the big questions. And I think that's the that's the most important starting point. It's not just about, um, you know, uh, uh, showing up each day and rinsing and repeating like we were. I think we have to step out of that and take this as an opportunity to actually ask really, really big questions. You know, even as simple as, what do I want to do? You know, if I go back to my normal, you know, working environment, is it really what I want? You know, could I be better? Could I do more? Maybe I should pursue that hobby. Maybe I should do that passion and start to dig deep, turn the TV off, number one rule, and start to utilise your time on, you know, outside of asking pragmatic questions, but advancing your cognition levels. I think this is the opportunity to actually do that, to be able to rise above the noise. And mm -hmm. once you can do that, then you can ask pragmatic questions and you actually start getting to the <clears> truth <throat> and stepping into your creativity. And that's what I do every day. And I use, um, you know, different uh, tools like journaling, for example, as simple as it may sound, it's such an important part of my day because that's where I am able to uh, express from a creative standpoint and then revisit that. Um, and for some reason, in my case anyway, it does that open up Pandora's box. So I think that the, 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 the message for me is turn the TV off, start to ask pragmatic questions, upskill any way you can, and that absolutely opens up the creative channel to be able to at least, at least consider other options. Nice. nice. Hey, hey Ryan, if, if, I can, if I could lean in on that also, is that now is the one point in time where it's almost like a no judgment zone. Um, you have CEOs, you have SVPs, you have uh, directors that are going through some of the same things that many people are. You know, they're doing these Zoom calls, the kids are running in the background, they got beards. It's this this whole thing has been a very humbling experience. And although there is no level playing ground, it has definitely shifted the playing ground some. And so understanding that it is now taking advantage of the opportunity that um, if you are typically in a corporate environment where you don't have that person leaning over your shoulder saying, what you doing? Right. Well, what's on your screen? Um, you have all of this time. If you walk out of this COVID-19 situation, because we will never, this is historic. This will never happen again in our lifetimes. I'm pretty certain. Um, if you don't take advantage of this and, and, and Mary said a key word, upskill, upskill on something, learn something, plan something, devise a strategy around something, come up with your what's next. If you don't take the opportunity to do that and you just keep on doing the same thing, you have, you've wasted time and you've missed out on what in a bigger picture, this whole situation has been all about. Right. So I tell anybody right now is the time where you go out and you do a different thing uh, and you pivot a different way. Josh, what's your take? There's a, there's three parts to answering your question. I think the first piece is <clears throat> how I address what I'm dealing with. And I'm dealing with it on a global scale with real people, real lives, real families mm -hmm. in real companies in high stressed environments. And um, so as a coach, after 20 years of coaching or 21 years now, um, I can't afford to get on the court emotionally. Mm -hmm. That doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve my clients. So I have to compartmentalize my emotional state so that I can be with my clients at any level, at any company. Once I've detached from that, and that's challenging. I want to be really clear about it because I have a family. I support them. I have a staff of people that work for me. I support them. They have families. And so no one is immune to what's happening in the pandemic right now. And we have to learn to first normalize and understand and be empathetic and compassionate with ourselves going through what we're going through and then understand where to draw the line and how to then serve our clients. And that right there is too much for the majority of people. But that's the first piece. The second piece, uh, similar to what um, uh, Nick has said and, and, and Mary has said, is that 
where I'm supporting my leaders outside of how to stay profitable, the big thing that's going on right now in the world of HR and, and corporations is who's going to be the first person out the gate to get people back in the office. And everyone's trying to solve something for the new norms that nobody understands. And nobody wants to be the first person to do it. But at the same time, everybody kind of wants to be the first person to do it. And so there's a, there's a larger conversation going on right now around how is the world going to get back to not where it was, because we'll never will be, but to these new norms. The third piece is around the upskilling piece. Right now, the people who will come out of this and be successful are the ones that are taking the time to learn something new about themselves. They're being introspective. They're being vulnerable. They're being humble. They're being quiet. They're being peaceful. They're being patient. And they're actually taking stock in who they are, what they do. Does it make them happy? Can they be successful? These are all the types of questions that many of the people on social media and online talk about, but they don't actually practice. Because when you actually do the work, you will get the answers. And you may not like what the answers are, mm -hmm. but those are the answers that are gonna help you drive to what's next. So the people that are actually doing the work right now, making the effort, no bullshit, doing the commitment, they're the ones that have come out of this and they're actually going to have a bright future. The people who I see currently who are just kind of spinning their wheels, trying to reinvent the same stuff in the same box are not going to be around six months, eight months or a year from now. They just won't because innovation, creativity are two of the critical skills that every single reputable journal has said is a must have for the next 2020 decade in for emerging and senior leaders. So if you're not working on yourself, then you're gonna be left behind. And I hate to be blunt about it, but that's kind of how I am. I just wanna be really truthful about it. So there's three parts to answer your conversation. There's managing yourself, there's managing your clients, and then there's managing your future. Really that's what's up. And that's what this is really about, guys. So so you, Josh, you just apologize for being blunt. You must not listen to Business and Bourbon enough because this is what we do. Like, <laughs> no. we, it's it's straight to the gut. Like people aren't, li they're not listening. They're not watching this. Yes. We can we can <laughs> them both. They're watching Ronnell, this. Let me yes, let me. Sir. I was on a Zoom call with two thousand, I think seven hundred eighty three people already today. My four year old runs in half <laughs> naked, screaming at me, throwing nice. a, a, a Game Boy thing at me, and I literally I literally turned red. I had to get off come back for pick up where I was. You got everybody started, blowing up, <laughs> everybody started blowing up the chat saying, oh, it's nice. The struggle's real, this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, I, I don't know what day it is sometimes. I say I'm being blunt. I don't need, you know, look, after Ike's whole thing, I'm ready to send him some money. That guy may, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening, but it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> hey, hey, next question, guys, I've got from JC. And um, I, I want to pose this to all you guys, but I'm going to hold you guys to 60 second limit. Question is, is branding more important now than before? Hell now, yeah. Assuming so. Uh, <laughs> that was quick. Hey, <laughs> Frank, what you got? You go first. Ah, no, no. So, yeah, I mean, branding to, to me, branding is something that I feel like we all have. If, if you consider brand or your reputation, that's something you should be taking serious at all times. I think now more than ever, people who are trying to capitalize on what's going on during the pandemic, I think that their reputation is either going to go one way or another. People can see see bullshit. They can smell that. They can see right through that. So if people are are kind of come in trying to trying to come in right now and and, and build a brand uh, based on something different that they were doing three months ago, I think people will see through that. So I think. Uh, I think if you consider the brand a reputation, which I would, uh, I'd say people who come out of here are, are going to be are, are going to be much stronger, and and people they're going to build those relationships. Love it, Josh. There's two people I trust my brand with. That's myself, and that's Mary Henderson. That's number one. <laughs> number two, the people that I see who are trying to brand themselves. Um, their approach is no different than putting up a website and selling toilet paper at a 400% increase right now. And let me be clear, right? These are the people and you're all shaking your head because you know, right? These are the shortcuts that everybody's trying to do. Anybody and everybody on this screen recognizes your brand is, is, a, is like your fingerprint. It's your DNA. Everything you do is an extension, everything you say, everything you wear and, and, most people don't do the work to recognize the deepness and the leveling that has to go into establishing your brand. Putting yourself out there is not your brand. That's one small piece of it. So honestly, I think people should be taking this time to really do the work, 
and understand, do you have a brand? Do you have a product? Maybe you just have a message. Maybe you have a pretty face and no message. I don't know. But people really need to take the time and understand that branding is not a simple uh, application on Canva that you can just process. So. Love it. Nick. Your brand is not your logo. Your brand is not your website. Your brand is not who you work for or used to work for. Your brand is two things and two things only. What do you want to be known for? And how do you want to make people feel? <clears throat> be known for a thing, one thing, because people do not have time to figure you out. They don't have time to figure out all the various interests that you have. Be known for one thing and make people feel. Feeling is one of the most important things associated with branding because feeling creates tribes and tribes build brands. If you don't get that in your head, if you don't recognize that, then you have lost the whole brand game. Preach. Beautiful. Mary. Nobody is going to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, I need your services or, for that matter, even if you're in a corporate role, tap you on the shoulder and say, you are the perfect marketing director that we've been looking for. We are in a situation where we're, we're in the knowledge age. Social currency has more value than anything else that we can that that we once upon a time treasured. Now, being seen and being heard is something that we need to do as a human being. Your brand is your business. It's as simple as that. You, as the human, are the business, and and that when I'm talking about personal branding. It is the human being that is the actual business, regardless whether you're in corporate or whether you're actually running your own business. The reality is that you will never be seen and heard if you don't put yourself out there. As Nick said, staying in strictly in your lane, understanding the one problem that you can solve, who it is that you can serve, and what it is that you can promise. Once you understand those three aspects of you and how you can deliver value to your tribe, then you're starting to build a brand. And to Josh's point, vanity metrics, your website, um, you know, all of that stuff, that noise is not your brand. That's an effect of the cause. And we need to understand that the ones that are calling themselves personal brands uh, who will be looking for jobs most likely in six to 12 months are mm. not what we're referring to here. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So, so all of you guys are just super qualified to answer that question. That's why I wanted to make sure that we that that, that I um, share JC's question with you guys. But one of the things I want to I, I want to bring everyone's attention back to one thing, because because, you know, there's a lot of talk about brands. Right. There's a lot of talk about personal brands and there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort into that. Uh, I think we'd all agree that some of that is misguided effort and they don't really know what they're doing yet. That's why they look to leaders in that and, and, and that feel like like the folks that are on this this particular uh, this platform. But I want to change the narrative. And what I'm really talking to my clients about is how are we going to go get customers? Like That's cool. We have a brand. We still have to sell. <laughs> I think that a lot of people. They start to build the brand and they're focused on building the personal brand and they're focused on building on, on building this persona and forgetting that at the end of the day, you still need to go put action to selling something. Go get your people. What the brand does is give you credibility. So when you go out there and I go knock on that door, I go grab that person and they see they come back and they look at my brand, they look at my credibility, what however that's presented online, whatever, and it says, Oh, this person is legit. Right now it's legit. But we, we need to put more action and more activity into actually selling. That's what I'm so you guys know, that's what I'm super passionate about. And that's what we talk about behind the scenes. How do we go get our customers? It's not just about putting it out there and hoping that they show up. We got to go get them. Hey, we're going to take a brief break, guys. And during that break, we're going to bring in Mr. Whedon. So, guys, I need you to refill your drink. Uh, we'll be back in like five minutes. Be ready to go. Um, Mary will be very hydrated because she's drinking water. Uh, Nick, <laughs> Nick will be another, uh, what do you say? He's not on Tito's this, this time. He's on another vodka. Uh, all right. 
we're going to bring in Dan Whedon. Um, and Dan's coming. Dan, let's bring Dan. In. Hey, Ronell, how are you doing, boss? Fantastic, my friend. I have. Look, I got to. Can I tell what you, you what, I, what I'm drinking? I wish you would. It is a called a Black Heron Bourbon. And Black Heron Distillery is a one man show in Richland, Washington. He, he, distills it and bottles it all himself and it is my favorite nice. bourbon can and when am i when are you sending it to me uh I'm, i'll start walking after I'll, I'll start my my hike from seattle all the way to atlanta right after the show bud no worries ups will get it here all right my friend the floor is yours <laughs> all right hey thank you for having me on uh Ronell, i don't know if you knew this i i coached high school basketball for six years and uh, what I learned was when I became a coach, as a player, I loved offense. As a coach, I came to love defense. So as I'm listening to the panel before me talking about brand, I made, a, I made an audible on what I was going to talk about because I really want to talk right now about how to defend your brand. You probably are all watching The Last Dance, right? With Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman, Phil Jackson, the whole thing. Well, the reason that Bulls team won so many championships, yeah, not only could they score, but man, could they defend. And as I'm listening to all these great speakers talking about brand and, and making money and revenue generation and all of that, and, and that's the offense part, and I'm all into that, we also have to defend. And what I'm going to talk about right now sometimes may not be considered the sexiest thing in the world, but it's really about going out and making sure, especially after the biggest crisis of our lifetime, to go out and make sure that your brand, your reputation, your people, everybody is protected. So here's what I mean. Every business out there, from the smallest to the Fortune 500, needs to have a game plan. And it's called a business continuity plan. It means that no matter what calamity happens, that you have the ability to keep operations going. And that's important because you're employing people who have families and lives. You're creating some product or service that is important to somebody else, whether it's a B2B or a B2C, right? And that in your community, you become an important part of that as well. So it's important that you keep operating. So just like in a basketball game, you could, you could try really hard to score, but if you're not defending your own basket, then you're going you're gonna to be running like that proverbial, excuse me, proverbial hamster over and over again. So you've got to get down to business and create a continuity plan that says, I have the ability to number one, be able to protect my people. Well, what's that mean? When they're all coming back from working at home, when the offices and the facilities and everybody's coming back, how are you going to secure that so they all know they're safe? What does that look like? You know, do you have to have distancing now between all the cubicles? Do you have to have a different sanitation schedule to make sure that everything is clean? What about the visitors that come in? Could you, could you get in touch with them if somebody in your office got sick? The protection, the security, uh, the maintenance of the building, everything has now changed. We used to take that a little bit for granted. We can't do that anymore. And don't get me wrong, or don't, don't forget that brand is also how you treat your employees. I promise you this, the companies are the, the best are the ones that treat their employees the best and the employees never leave because they love working there. So it's really important to treat them well. Revenue generation is the second place. You've got to be able to make sure that no matter what happens, you can go make money. I heard you all just talking about making money. That is absolutely correct. But what we just learned right now is if you can't make money virtually, you've got a big problem. And it doesn't matter whether you are a restaurant a sports bar, a manufacturer, whatever. You've got to be able to make money virtually. That is defending your business, defending it to make sure that you have a plan in place to go through and to do that. 
And the third one really revolves around that overall branding. You work so hard to, to create an environment and to create that brand, whether you're on Main Street or on Wall Street, right? So take a look at what some of the emerging risks are. Uh, you know, we, we all think this, this, this would never happen. Who, who thought even in January that something like this could happen? So nothing's off the table. Let me tell you what right now, moving forward is probably the biggest risk that all of you face, regardless of what type of business it is. And that's cyber. That's, that's cyber crime that's out there. Think of all the people who are working from home right now, not in an office, and they're working from their private residence. And the password is the name of their dog. Some of that, so you might be one of them. You know, it's the name of your kid or it's the name of your dog. How safe is all of that intellectual property, all of that hard work, the proprietary information, all of that work that you've put into has to be secured. And cyber, it, it's only going to get worse right now. So you have to be able to have a plan. Final thing, insurance is actually pretty cool. I know that nobody really likes insurance unless somebody has a funny commercial, but without insurance, couldn't operate. Nobody could run a business. You couldn't put vehicles out on the road, right? You couldn't have people come into your stores because you might be sued. Heck, we can't even drive our cars around without insurance. So insurance is really important. And what we're finding is, is that if you're not careful, you might be uninsured because you didn't take the time to work with somebody to help get insured properly and to make sure that everything related to not only this pandemic, but to cyber and to all of the other emerging risks are taken care of. So to close up, get a game plan. It's called a business continuity plan. Have somebody, and I'm, I'm happy to talk with you, no cost, no obligation, uh, drop me a line. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Create a business plan, a business continuity plan. Make sure you know how to grow revenue regardless of what happens. Take care of your people because that's part of your reputation. You need them and they need you. Buy the right insurance and then go make a whole lot of money. Ronell, I think, I think I'm out of time and I'm going to throw it right back to you. I'm catching it. Dan, fantastic. Great share, my guy. Appreciate that. Um, enjoy your next glass. And I will be expecting that bottle here soon. Take, take care. All right, guys. Hey. Uh, let's bring our panel back in. Hey, before we kick off these next couple of questions, um, <laughs> I, I'd love it if you guys, because we've all got a ton of stuff going on. Um, there are boot camps and um, master classes. Um, I just want to, if, if you guys have a, an event that's about to kick off here over the summer, um, June, July, that people can should probably be aware of to try to take advantage of it. I want to give you a sec to go ahead and, and plug that so they know that, that, that we're going to have that. And guys, so you, so that you know, everyone that's that's watching this stream, I'm going to send out, my team will send out all of this information after the event. So you'll get contact information for everyone. You'll also know what, you know what's going on with them and how you can work with them further. But Mary, anything fun going on that you want people to know about? If anyone is ready to commercialize their brand um, and digitalize their knowledge, um, <coughs> book a 45-minute strategy call with me, which is maryhendersoncoaching.com slash apply, and let's have a conversation. Awesome. Frank. What up? Yeah, so so no no ebooks, no courses for me, but check me out every day because I'm putting on a master class on LinkedIn all the time. All right. <laughs> the brandpreneur. <laughs> um, brand line is the intersection of personal branding and Greek culture. I've been in a fraternity for over 25 years. And what I'm doing now is I am doing membership intake on a personal branding scale with people. So right now I have a May cohort, close to 30 individuals where we're taking them from zero to brand in 30 days. Uh, just opened up the application process for our June and July cohorts where we're doing the same, uh, giving you brand clarity, uh, helping you to figure out your image, um, giving you the skill set of social security, not from the government, but 
um, you being secure online in terms of putting yourself out there, even teaching you how to do video and edit straight from your phone, uh, creating a landing space for you so that when people search your name, they find you. It's really you elevating your brand and you getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, we do that in a group environment so you're not alone and we work collaboratively to do that. So brandpreneur, U-E-R, because it's all about you, not E-U-R, but U-E-R dot com forward slash brand line. I'd love to work with you. Awesome. And we'll get all that information out in email. So you guys all got that as well. Uh, Josh, you got anything com coming up you want people to know? I do. I do have something coming up. Um, you know, I always say that you can't expect greatness from your leaders if your leadership great, your leadership training isn't great. And after about 20 years and about one full year working with Mary, um, I've actually put together a coaching program that is unlike anything that exists currently. And uh, I'm kind of dubbing it the on-demand course for the in-demand leader. And uh, it will be launching very soon. So just stay tuned. Follow me on LinkedIn or follow my website and uh, you'll get details. And again, guys, we'll have the contact information for everyone. So you can make sure I want to want you to make sure to follow all these fantastic people. I have tremendous respect for everyone here. Um, I've got something to plug really quick. Uh, we all you guys, if you, if you know me, you know, the sales chump, you know, the sales chump, taking chumps, making them champs. June, we are going to training camp. Yes, I am right now accepting applications for entrepreneurs, business professionals that need to up their sales game. We spoke a little bit earlier about how in building personal brands, which is awesome. I'm going to send you to Mary. I'm going to send you to, to Nick, build your brand, and I'm going to tell you how to sell it. All right. So that's what that's about. If you want to be considered for that, you'll get links and all that. You can apply to that. All right. Back to you guys, because this is what it's all about. I got a, tr a terrific question here that um, I love this one. And, and this is something that every single one of us can resonate with. And this is from Cross Conrad. Conrad. Which, by the way, what a dope name, Cross Conrad! Isn't that like yeah, a love it. like a a secret spy or something? Sounds like a DI <laughs> Joe character. <laughs> I like that. All right, Cross says, "My dad and I are starting a real estate investment company. This is our first time starting a business, and we were wondering how have you dealt with fear and anxiety of starting new ventures? I think we all know a little bit about that." <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? Mary, you want to tackle that? Why not? I remember when I transitioned from corporate into my, my own business, and I always talk about that 24-hour period, that transition from my phone going crazy, being on a plane twice a week, hundreds of emails, to the very next day where no phone calls, no emails, no planes. And that, that transition taught me something very, very powerful, and that is this that when you transition into entrepreneurship, you must have a tribe. It's like the greatest lesson I wish somebody gave me before I transitioned because I had to then find a tribe of people that I could reach out to and, you know, share my my deepest vulnerabilities, my fears, my uncertainties, uh, ask for uh, knowledge and advice, and I didn't have that tribe. And the only advice I give everyone that's transitioning into or starting their own business is find a tribe of professionals who can carry you and support you and give you the right advice. And if they can't give you the right advice, uh, send you in the right direction. Nice. I'll go up next. Um, oh, Brian, what you got? Learn how to be your own cheerleader. Um, in this world, no one is going to sit on the courts. You are not Jordan, okay? You're not LeBron James. You're not Steph Curry. They're not going to sit on the sidelines and just automatically cheer you on. Um, if you aren't in your corner, if you don't believe in you, then if you ain't on your team, who the hell is going to be on your team? Um, if you believe you can do it, if you have faith that you can do it, um, some of you, you self-defecate. You uh, self-sabotage. You get in your head. You're like, well, no, that's not, that'll never work. No. If, if no one else is cheering you on, you have to cheer yourself on. Don't expect your spouse to do it. Don't expect your kids to do it. Don't expect your friends to do it. Don't expect your former co-workers to do it. Don't expect anybody else to do it. You have got to believe in you. That's the key to get through. Nick, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, I think stepping in, and, and by the way, great comment. 
Um, it's a lonely road. Entrepreneurship is a lonely road. Um, I think what a lot of us have learned over the years of of scar tissue is that um, <laughs> are, are, do we have some laughter? <laughs> it's scar we, tissue, man. It really is scar tissue. We, we've we've learned to, uh, to build our tribe to Mary's point, right? Um, early on, that's a little bit harder to do. So, you know, what I always encourage my entrepreneurs to do is really focus on self-care because to Nick's point, you have to be your biggest cheerleader. And that's hard as hell to do. It really is. Um, because sometimes you just don't feel like it. So, you know, whether it's whether it's it's meditation for I, I'll just share what I've done in my career, meditation, physical fitness, all of these things I do to try to keep the mood high, um, focusing on, on staying hydrated. You, you know, a lot comes back to how we treat ourselves, treat our, our bodies. You treat your body well, treat your brain well. That's one thing that I think a lot of folks don't think don't think about too much is how are we treating this bad boy? You know, with what we're eating, with what we're supplementing, are we hydrated? All the thing, all of these things matter. So at this stage in my career and in my life, I'm focused, you guys know I'm a fitness guy, but I'm more focused on this bad boy. So bring the focus to this and making sure that you're operating at a high level intellectually. And to, to Mary's point, try to find your tribe, which is easier to do now than it ever was with social. And that's a great start. Um, Josh, what do you think? I mean, I'm just going to echo kind of what Mary said and what Nick said. I, you know, I'm biased because as a coach, people look to me for the number one thing I believe is necessary for anyone to be successful is accountability. We cannot hold ourselves accountable. Not even the greatest of the great were held accountable. Even Michael Jordan had Phil Jackson or Scottie sure. Pippen or, uh, you know, I mean, I could go on and on and on. And so, the people that have the greatest ideas that fail fast, and I don't, I'm forget about failing forward or leaning in or any of that other stuff. Um, they didn't have, they didn't have accountability. And the second piece to this is around the tribe. Um, I have my own board of directors, and I don't say that from a place of arrogance. What that is is a, a group of people that I trust, and I know that they will never bullshit me. They will be honest with me, and their only role is in service of my greatness and my goals. Now, when you can find people like that, you hold on to them for dear life. That is your tribe. That's your true north. When, when and if you can create and find those people, you don't let them go through the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows. That's what tribalism is. That's what's going to help you be successful. You're going to fail. You're going to all that other stuff. But when you can go back to those people that will tell you the honest truth that nobody else is going to tell you, that's what's going to help you as an entrepreneur or just in anything in life move forward. Awesome. Frank. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I got a, a take on this and, and an opinion because of the fact that I'm on my fourth company. Um, in my first company, I found some success. My second and third, I found some failures. Uh, and I think people, people. Hold going, on, wait, pause. What? <laughs> Failure? <laughs> Failure? What? No, really? Uh, <laughs> it happens. It's according to okay. <laughs> Not on social media. It doesn't happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on social media. Um, yeah I mean, pe that's the thing is that people see social media and it's models and bottles and boats and jets yeah. and fashion and people talking into stacks of cash. And, and that's not real life. Um, yeah. so I think anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur, you got to be prepared for risk. Um, and yeah. and I, you know, I've been broke. Um, when, when you have to meet payroll uh, and you got a team that relies on you, and you have people that their family relies on you to pay their car payments and their mortgage. And you got no one to go to because it's you. You're the person. It's stressful. Um, it's risky. I mean, I wouldn't change it for anything, but it's not, people are not prepared for the risk of being an entrepreneur. They see the glamorization of it. They don't. We don't show the risk of being an entrepreneur enough. And it's a lot of risk. It is. It's lonely. Um, and having a tribe is important. Having people that will tell you, nope, you're doing it wrong. You need to do it this way. Or Josh, everyone's nailed it. You, you do. You have to be around people who are going to keep it real with you uh, because yeah. you get around fluff and everyone's like, rah, 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 because you're doing it. And then when you hit the bottom, everyone's like, nope, I'm out. You know? How about this one, guys? How about this one? How about understanding your risk tolerance, right? Like um, there are different forms of 
entrepreneurship. Side hustling is entrepreneurship. That's cool too. Everyone doesn't have to be all in, right? Like everyone can't do what Frank's done. Everyone can't do what I what what I've done. You have to really understand your own. Be honest with yourself. Would well, you guys agree? Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but oh, sorry, Frank's Mary, girl. go. No, go, Josh. You go. You no, go. but let me see. This is this is what's systemic and 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 a trigger for me on social media and LinkedIn in general is that you have a ton of what what Mary coined this phrase. I love it. Is a a tech expert, right? Somebody who is just spinning yarn and, and, and then everyone else does it. And you're not, you're going to spend a lot of your time and your money and, and energy into something that is just probably going to turn out to be a waste. And, and if you have the right people around you, hopefully they'll be the ones to guide you and say, Hey, don't go down that path of this pseudo, whatever this is called, or, you know, like do the work. And I, and I think, um, I think that's the, the slippery slope for entrepreneurs in general is that, you know, we're risk averse as human beings, right? There's a fight or flight. It's embedded into our brain. And, you know, if you're going to go all in, well, all in for you is going to be different for somebody else. I mean, I, I hate when people say, give it a hundred percent. Well, maybe 80% is a hundred percent of somebody else, somebody else. and 20% is equivalent to 100. I know somebody who gets out of bed at three o'clock in the afternoon, one of the wealthiest people I've ever met. They don't get out of bed because they're lazy. They get out of bed because their productive time is from three o'clock in the afternoon to like eight in the morning. It's just odd hours. But that doesn't make them any less of a person. That's just what they do. That's their 100%. But people have to recognize that if you're trying to copy somebody else, you're, you're good. it's a recipe for failure. It just you don't do the work, then you're going to think you're going to be a carbon copy of somebody else. And and it, and it, I see this when I work with leaders who read the next book, who think leaning in or dancing out or whatever the next craze is, and they think that's what I got to do. And I'm telling you, the most important thing entrepreneurs could do is unlearn everything that they've already think that they know. Go sit with people who have failed, like Frank, and been yeah. successful, like Frank. Somebody like Nick who understands brand and Mary. And then you will get a taste of humble pie because you will then realize what you do know, what you don't know. And then the gap in between is the work that you need to do. Hey, Josh, you, you know, you know what I tell people, yeah. especially, especially when I'm, when I'm bringing on new team members is I, I, I bring on team members based off of the ability for somebody to save me from myself. See, I'm a marketing guy, big ideas, think I can do the world. And saving me from me is, you know, challenging me. It's giving me a dose of reality. It's challenging me to think differently, telling me when I'm wrong or when I've even messed up or when I'm not doing the right thing. You know, that that is, as an entrepreneur, you need people to save you from yourself. Because if you're just, you know, dependent upon you or if you're just you know, thinking the way you think, then you don't have anyone to assist you in thinking differently. And oftentimes it's that difference that gets you to where you need to go next. Yeah, I think that, that's an awesome ad, Nick. And um, here's one one thing I'd add to that is, you know, in, in fact, I was speaking with a new client. It's like yesterday, the day before. And one of the challenges she had is that she had too many voices, right? Like there's a lot of people that want to tell her what, what to do, different mentors, different people that are in her circle. So the one thing I would say, and I qualify this, is make sure that you don't make your group too big, first of all, and make sure that the people, they have that experience, they have that wisdom and, and pay for it. Like, listen, we're, we all coach here. It's okay. Like pay for it. Like there's mentors are, are, are awesome. They'll come in and give you some occasional advice, but a coach is in it with you, Right. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the ability, like you have a tremendous network, Nick, a lot of us have, have tremendous networks. So it's, it's easier to pull great people in to be part of our team. If you don't have that yet, go find a great coach that, yeah. that, can, that can help you with that journey. Hey, hey, question. hey wait, Ronell, can I just I, I, this is probably for Nick. I, the the, uh, the quote that I love is that um, make sure the people in your circle are also in your corner. Oh, also, in your man. Yeah. There you go. Hundred <laughs> percent. Josh, me, you can, we can hang out for a beer, my brother. We, yeah, let's do it. We, we think alike. We think alike. Yeah. There we go. So the W question. <laughs> woo woo. 
<laughs> um, and this is from this is from Bobby Carbus, one of my guys. Love Bobby up there in, in North Carolina. Bobby says, "How have you all had to change your strategy to push forward during this time? How have you had to change your strategy? Who wants to tackle that first? I'll actually just talk real quick about it. I won't I won't go too long, but um, I haven't changed my strategy at all. Actually, um, I've continued to just do what I do and show up." how I show up for the people I serve. No um, if you change too much, depending on what you do, and I, and, I, and I recognize that everyone does something different. So certain people in certain industries are going to have to shift dramatically. But yeah. for, as a coach, the only thing that's shifted for me is my intentionality. So I'm still showing up. I just may be showing up a notch more. Um, so you could argue, is it working smarter versus harder? I don't know, maybe a little but I'm not changing anything. And I think what you're posing is a really good question because I think a lot of people hear pandemic, they get on the news, they start watching social media and they think they got to do a 180 or a 360 or a 250 or whatever it is. And that's, that's very dangerous uh, to do. So that's, that's my answer. Can I just add to that, Josh? Cause I think yeah. that's a really important point. This is why consistency is so critical yeah. because when there is a pandemic of any capacity, no matter how big or small it is, we already need to be showing up in the environment that we need to be in to be having a conversation with prospects or potential clients or building a tribe, whatever it is that you want to do. And in my situation, I'm exactly like Josh, business as usual. But one magical thing has happened for me, and that is that the people that have been following me for a year ago or I've spoken to a year ago are now calling back saying, how can we move forward? This is why consistency is critical. Who else wants to tag on to that? I'll do it. You know, in terms in terms of um, my business, it's um, it's shift. It's it's all about it's all about a, a shift. It's not. I still do the same thing. I just do it a bit differently, right? And that's the power of being a brand. Um, the power of being a brand and being intentional is this. Uh, one of the things that we do is we lean in too much into these social networks. I've been very intentional in terms of, of building an outside list, using stuff other than LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn's great. I don't put all my bad eggs in the LinkedIn basket, right? I got a list. Uh, I got a, you know, I do sales funnels. I do, you know, other stuff, right, to help keep the pipeline going. And I think that um, because of that, being a brand is more the, so than just being known for something. It's actually having the infrastructure in place to actually take on people and put them through a process, right? Brands have a process. If you look at McDonald's, McDonald's is the most successful small business in history because of process, right? Far too often, we forget the good old fashioned P, process process is still there it's just what i do is shifted a bit and now uh because infrastructure is there it just allows me to pivot and be a little bit more agile than the next person hmm. frank you got an ad yeah i mean anyone listening in here can 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 definitely attest to the fact how many people have suddenly received an email or a, or a call or seen a piece of content from some from someone. Hey, we care about you during this time. It's like all of a sudden they show up. <laughs> so, you know, I haven't heard from you for weeks, months, years. <laughs> now you care about me. Literally, the, the number of emails and, and ads and everything I've seen. I mean, people have they. they I mean, the, the way that they've made commercials so quickly to show up and say, you know, lease a car for eighty four months. We, you know, we're good. Zero yeah. percent. It's like okay, I get it, but we, we know that they're opportunistic people yeah. that have do that are doing this now and showing up during this time, and we haven't seen them before. You haven't been worried about me and my finances when you were sending me collection notices, but now yeah. you're worried about me. <laughs> we can smell the the opportunistic people out there, and I think it, like like Joshua said, like I mean, we all can resonate the fact that we've been doing the right thing all along. Yeah, we may have to make some moves and some changes based on it, but we're in there for the right intentions the whole time, and nothing has had to change that because because we're doing things by, by we want to be right by people. The opportunity people, we're going to see that, 
And, and no one's no, you're not going to win that way. That's a short term strategy and it's not going to win. Hey, Sue Joy. Hey, Felita. So, awesome. So, awesome. That's all. all right. I see Nick Nelson is hanging out there. I'm going to um, welcome everybody. This is Source hey. Webinar Two of Five. Talking today. I'm, hey, I'm about to, hey, I got another one I got to join in, Ronnell. So, so one of the, what I will add to that, guys, real quick. Let us let us wrap here. We're going to wrap this in like two minutes here, and, yeah. and bring Lisa on. Um, is, is that path to entrepreneurship success is not straight? It's full of pivots. It's full of obstacles. So what? So to to Bobby's question and changing strategy. Hell yeah. I change strategy. I adjust strategy all the time. What I do not adjust is my philosophy of how I do business. You know, the philosophy, your philosophies don't change. For me, it's always about driving revenue and it's always about building advocates. That's those are my philosophies. I want to build advocates and I want to be the driver of revenue. Right now, how I accomplish that, the strategy. Yeah, yeah it, it's going to change. It's going to evolve and it should. I know what it feels like to have to close a company where you didn't pivot fast enough. Right. That's not fun. Frank, you've probably been there as well. Yep. <laughs> We're now. It, I think the thing is you can change your strategy, but don't change your lane. Right. Mm. And, and that's, this is what people do is they get off the nearest on ramp, right. Or off ramp. And mm. they say, all right, well, this isn't working. Right. They're not in it long enough. And to, to, to Frank's point earlier, you know, I think the, the collection of, of us here at minus Nick, when he was here before you asked, you know, how much are you changing or pivoting right now? Not, not, the, not that much. You know, yeah. and again, what what a lot is is different for everybody. But if you if you've got something that's been proven and you know who you are and you know your lane, then, yeah, you could come up with a different strategy or a different philosophy or pivot on that. But at least, you know, where the guardrails are. And I think most people don't even know that. So they're trying to create and shift and they don't even know what lane they're in. And I think that's mm -hmm. a, a huge problem for many um, entrepreneurs who are starting. Any anyone want to add to that? That was awesome. We'll we'll end with that. So so here's the thing, guys. Um, again, we'll make sure that everyone gets. Uh, we're gonna send out an email. Everyone will get would get contact information. But what I need you guys to do is to make sure that you're on the app. Make sure you download the app. Everyone is going to be the app. This is where we're gonna take these conversations offline, right? So. I, unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer. We've got tons of questions and I wish I could I could take the next, they don't, but I wish I could take the next five hours <laughs> asking them questions. But Mary's got to get her day started. Uh, Josh is in the middle of the day and, and Frank has got to go take care of the kids. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I want to encourage you guys to do is like everyone is on the network. Ask your questions. That's why I built the network so that you can ask questions of these fantastic people that are on the platform, right? You can ask questions, you can get access to the people that are either on the LinkedIn Live platform or the Business and Bourbon uh, podcast and, and really um, connect in a way that, that we can't on some of these larger networks. So do that before we close this bad boy and move to Lisa. Hold on, guys, because we've got Lisa Holmes next. And a lot of you folks, I don't know, what are the unemployment rates? Josh, you know, what are the unemployment rates right now? Well, I think they're, I think they're close to, was it 14%? I have no idea. I, I, they're maybe even higher. Crazy. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, we haven't seen levels like this. This is past what 2008, 2007 was. Um, yeah, I don't know why we're, why are we talking about unemployment? Le why are we going there? Here's why. why are we bringing it to that? Here's why? Because Lisa Holmes is our last speaker okay. and she's going to teach, she's going to talk to people about how, how to get great jobs. Good. How to get great okay. jobs, how to get better Perfect. jobs. Because right Perfect. now, people need to know how to differentiate themselves. They need to know how to stand out if they're going to get a gig. Um, a lot of people that are watching this are working in corporate. They're not necessarily going full-time entrepreneurship. They need some guidance, so we got to serve you. We're here to help you out. All right, guys. As we close, I want to thank you guys so much for your participation. And Nick, peace out. Appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I'm coming to see you. Frank, That's I'm going to go see about you this this summer. Josh, can yeah. I get an invite to Austin? Yeah, you will. You absolutely. We when when everything lifts, you will come. You can stay at my house, and we can go and we can go do a a, a bourbon whiskey tour in downtown Austin. 
I'm I'm there, and you think I'm playing, but I'm not. No, I'm I know up. you're not playing. I know you're not playing. <laughs> when it's I all show good. up with this, yeah. Well, maybe I'll invite the RZA. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. Yes. Thanks, Thank you Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Love it. Take care, everybody. Be safe. All right, guys, um, before we kick into Lisa, let's give some stuff away. I got tons of stuff to give away. So we're going to give a few things away. Then after we wrap, we're going to do some random raffles and just shoot you guys some emails. So you'll get an email say, hey, look, you won something. Pretty cool. All right. So um, let's give away some glasses. Okay. I got a um, Glencairn glass, business and bourbon Glencairn glass. Okay. Oh, my friend Kathleen. Kathleen Bailey, you like you need another glass. <laughs> she, she doesn't need any more glasses, but you won the glass. All right. T shirts. T shirts. Give me some people. Gina Riley. Gina Riley. Gina Riley. Good friend. Gina gets t shirt. Next. Marlon Addison. Marlon, my guy. Marlon gets a t-shirt. Okay, let's give away another one of Kathleen's beautiful, beautiful bourbon glasses. Can you hand me one, please, my assistant? All right. Oh, this one's pretty. Look at that. No, I'm not handing. I'm keeping this. <laughs> who, who is this going to? Andrew Kootsman. Andrew Kootsman. This is you, my friend. That's beautiful. Yeah, we may have to arm wrestle for it. Okay, assistant, let's get one more of Kathleen's. Ooh, this one's pretty. Nevertheless, <laughs> this is dope too. All right. Look at that. Suliana. Suliana. Oh my God, Suli, Suliana. I know you, Suliana Chandler, my friend. You are the winner of that. So I don't have. We don't have to ship that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and bring Lisa on. So, are you there? I'm here. Look at that big, beautiful blow up behind you. I love that. But what is that? A big pull out banner? Love it. Yes, yes. It absolutely so Lisa, is. You, know that, you know, we were just talking on the panel, at, you know, where we're at on unemployment rates, you know, 14 headed towards, I heard headed towards 20. Um, which tells yeah. me we've got 20% unemployment. How much underemployment do we have? You know, so what is what does that number look like? Which which tells me there's a lot of people that are either looking for gigs or want better gigs, right? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. When I thought about jobs, I'm like, no, oh, we need to help people out. I'm like, we have to have Lisa on. So thank you so much for for awesome. hopping on and being part of this. And there's no one better to come in as the cleanup hitter <laughs> <laughs> and 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 hit us a home run home. Yeah. Nice. Yours, my friend. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, you know, uh, so you know me obviously now is the HR person. So I've been in HR my entire career and have worked for some of the largest employers in the world and led the HR function for them. And in some cases, I've consulted with some of those same employers in some privately held companies. So in my 30 years of HR, I have seen it all, right? I have been through the ebb and flows of human resources. One of the things that people most know me for is I'm kind of the keep it real girl. If the baby's ugly, I tell you the baby's ugly, right? And I wanted to write a book and give people the real truth around the job search process, how to navigate the modern career search. And throughout my career, I can't tell you the numerous conversations that I've had with people um, who want to know, how do I find a job? What's the right resume? How do I get in front of the hiring manager? Um, what do I need to know to be best prepared for the interview process itself? And so I wrote what is exactly that. The book is called Job Hunting, Now What? Keeping It Real in a Modern Career Search. I released it last February. And it really was, again, my way of sharing what I think everyone needs to know to have a level playing field in going out 
into the job market. So there is no doubt that this is kind of a very unusual, unprecedented time that we're in right now. Who would know today we're sitting at 14.7% unemployment? It's crazy. So how do you navigate the process and then find and uncover the job that's the next role and opportunity for you? So in the very first chapter of the book, couldn't be more befitting than where we are today. It's called, What the Hell Just Happened to Me? The world as we know it is different. The job search process is different. And in this process, we have to recognize that there are going to be the five steps of grief. No, in the job search process, nobody has actually died, but it can feel like a death, right? The world that you know it is different. The job you might have had for a long period of time is gone. Maybe you've gone through four years of college and now today you've landed in the job market. And so the life that you knew as a student is different. And here we are today in, the, in this COVID job search process. So I want to tell you about navigating those five steps of grief. First of all, let's acknowledge they exist. Most often we feel embarrassed or we don't want to admit that there is an emotional journey that you will be on in this job search process. Again, in the book, the very first chapter, I talk about what those five stages look like. And so I'm going to be real quick and brief, and I want to let you know I'm going to pull um, a lot of some of this material. There's some excerpts from the book, and I just want to share them with you. So the very first step is called denial and isolation. So you might have heard um, maybe the day that they came in and told you at work that you were going to be laid off. It might have sounded like if you saw Charlie Brown's old movies, you heard the womp, 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 womp. You know somebody was saying something, but you really don't know what they said because for a minute you kind of almost had an out-of-body experience because it was a tragedy right? It was tragic that something just happened to you. The isolation could be that you took that and you went and retreated to yourself, right? You're just kind of in disbelief and really just don't know where to go and what to do from here. The second step is anger, right? Maybe you spent a good deal of your time with an organization and in that time, you made a lot of personal sacrifices. You worked a lot of overtime. You you know, sacrificed your personal time. So now you start to reflect on those things. Then the third step might be bargaining. So you start to com contemplate, well, maybe if I had done this, I wouldn't have been one of those that would have been laid off or looking for a job at this time. In this particular state of the world, it probably would not have mattered. At this point, it's all a business decision. Just know that. Step number four is depression. It's real. Every day, you have to figure out how to put one foot in front of the other in this COVID-19 job search. What does that look like? It's going to feel challenging. It's going to feel unfamiliar. You're going to feel like the, the floor has been swept from up under your feet. And it's natural. And then step number five is acceptance. Is that at some point in time, you realize, okay, this is the path and the journey that I'm on. And now how do I get on the other side of it? So recognizing those five steps and working through them as quickly as you can to be best ready now to attack the job search process. The three things that I wanted to share with you all today on how to quickly be ready for the process. Now, you know, there's lots of things, lots of tips and tricks that I tell you in the book. A lot of the HR um, secrets that I share with people in the book, but I want to share the, the three things three things that I think are going to be most helpful for you today. Perform a skills assessment. What does that mean? Take a look at everything that you've done in your career. 
and literally just make a list. So maybe, you know, you project managed, um, maybe you led a team, um, maybe you had um, a difficult uh, project or task at work and you had a significant impact on the business. You want to be able to bring all of those things to the forefront of your remembrance and just make a complete list of them. We're going to be as HR people looking for folks that have a variety of skills. We wish that we could go back and saying that everybody will fit neatly in a box. And we say, yes, you know, they've got this skill and that skill and everything just fits so nicely and tied up in a bow. That is not going to happen. So you're going to have to set yourself apart by bringing all of your skills to the table. Everything that you have to offer, you need to make note of. And there's a way to do that in the actual resume. And I'll talk to you just briefly about that in a minute. But you want to make sure that you bring your entire self, all of your skills and all of your abilities to the process. So you can very quickly be able to speak to those things in your resume and in the interview process. So I mentioned briefly about your resume. In the book, I go very much in detail on what kind of resume you need to write based on your career journey. But in this particular case, what I want to talk about is the applicant tracking system as it relates to your resume. The applicant tracking system is when you actually apply online to, your, to a job posting, your resume then falls into the applicant tracking system. We as HR people have set up the job description and noted some keywords, some skills, um, some abilities in the actual job description. The applicant tracking system will score now your resume based on the number of those keywords that you use. So two things that you need to know. Be very clear about what the job description says and be very honest to align your prior skill set to those particular skills that are in the job description because the job, the applicant tracking system will then rank you according to the number of keywords that are indicated in your resume not the cover letter, your resume. So, for example, I might say in the job description must have, um, you know, led a small team of five people minimally. Um, maybe, you know, I'm looking for somebody who also has, you know, worked well across the organization, partnered with others at multiple levels of the organization, Maybe they need to have a strong business acumen. Those are the kinds of things that the applicant tracking system is going to be looking for in your resume. So we as HR people might see, honestly, and I can only imagine what this is going to look like in this COVID-19 job search, where there's going to be thousands that are going to apply for one job. So you need to make your very best effort to nail that resume every single time. Do not take a blanketed approach that you're going to send out that same resume every single time. Because if you try to neglect the fact that those keywords are going to be so relevant and you being ranked in the candidate pool, you might be candidate 25. Well, me as an HR person, I only have time to maybe look at 20 top candidates that were ranked according to the applicant tracking system. So I highly unlikely will be able to even review your information because you've not ranked high enough based on those keywords. So be very, very keyed in on those words and making sure they show up well in your resume. 
The other thing, be flexible about the type of work that you are willing to take. So we're in a different environment, maybe in your past role, right? Maybe you, you know, maybe you um, led a, a, a big team and maybe you were an executive level role and maybe that's changed for you today. That same skill set, though, of managing teams, operational efficiency, your business acumen might work in a different wall. And that might be the footing that you need to get in the door with a new organization. So be flexible. So many times in my career, I've worked with people who have um, are in transition as I'm coaching them. They're in transition. Um, they're looking to, uh, you know, maybe pivot to a new opportunity, but they have this really kind of um, mindset that they don't want to change or they don't want to pivot to something different. They want to, you know, have things as nice and neat to their comfort. But I can tell you that this is going to be a time where you're going to be uncomfortable. And again, working through those five steps of grief, right, will help you to be able to adjust to what you're going to now feel is this new norm in the job search process. In the book, I tell you everything I think you need to know. And I'm going to cover very quickly some topics in the content. And because I want you to understand how relevant this book will be. It is a very quick read. It is less than 100 pages. I didn't go out and quote a bunch of things that you guys can go out and look up on the internet. That is not what this is about. This was my labor of love to share with you everything that I think you need to know from an HR person who just kind of kicks it to you straight. So here you heard what the hell just happened to me. I talk about assessing your career landscape. I talk about how to fine tune your skills, how to develop a smart search strategy. So how do you uncover jobs that aren't necessarily posted on every job board? This thing here is going to be a game changer because everybody is going to want to sit behind a computer and apply to the jobs that are out there on Indeed, LinkedIn, everywhere that they can find them. So, however, I don't know how effective you can be when there's going to be thousands of people applying for the same jobs. So I tell you in this book how to get past that. Mental agility, how to hone that skill. And this is going to be also really, really important for you in this, in this time. And then don't hide, get connected. Connecting to the right people, sharing what you're looking for. And I tell you how to prepare what I call your brand pitch, not your elevator pitch. What are people going to need to know about you as a professional and how to frame that in a comfortable conversation? I even tell you that all recruiters are not created equal. And I know that sounds crazy coming from the HR person, but you heard me say at the beginning, I warned you, I kick it to you straight. They are not all created equal. So what are you going to need to look for when you start to work with uh, a recruiter? And who should you be seeking that's going to help you possibly find your next opportunity? The secret weapon. I tell you my very own secret weapon that I have used for decades in my personal career. And every single time I've used this, I got the job offer. So that one there, you want to know. Is That's it worth it in itself. You want to know what the secret weapon is? <laughs> everyone needs that secret weapon, no no doubt. Lisa, you know, yeah. I, when, I, when, when I introduced you, I knew that you'd be hitting the home run. I'm like, oh, my cleanup hitter coming here and just hit it out of the park, lit it a Sammy Sosa. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so, so much for, for sharing and helping folks to level up. But um, this is just the beginning. Guys, get out there. I have a copy of her book. It is fantastic. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it any damn where. 
Amazon, Amazon Walmart, Target, Target, Barnes and Noble. Walmart. Is Barnes and Noble yeah. still around? Yes, absolutely. You can get the book hey. online, Barnes and Noble. <laughs> Tomorrow, I, I don't know. My friends at Barnes and Noble. Are you kidding? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Lisa, thank Any you so much. Store, I can get it for you. Thank you so much for having me. And so, don't forget, Ronnell. I've got a couple little giveaways. Yes. You're up. Lisa's got some giveaways. Um, hold on. Look at the comments. And Shelby will send you the, the winner's name. Okay. Lovely. Thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. We're coming up. In the meantime, while she's putting that in, what are you drinking? Water, sir. <laughs> don't, don't, be, don't be sad about it. Say oh, I'm water. Right. Water. I'm really, water. You know, I'm on my health journey. I am, I, you know, Me I try too. to keep it. I keep it, right? <laughs> I keep oh, it. You don't know. Water. The, the 1856, Uncle Nearest lived like to be 120 years old, drinking this every day. So that's that's my that's what I'm about. All right. Well, I, I know some people have done it, right? A hundred years old and they still drink their wine or beer every day, whatever. Yeah. Um, you got the first winner there for you to announce, Lisa. You guys will send me this this right so I can because okay. I'll need to know how to reach out. Okay. So you got do you you have those in the comments, Lisa? Uh no, I don't see it. Hold on. They're in the chat. You have two people listed. Can you email them to me? Nope, I'm saying them. All right. <laughs> okay. Our winners, I need, I need our winners are Janet Kimbrough and Jamal Boulder are the winners All of right. the books. So we will get their contact information to you so you can get those books shipped on out. Um, we guys, I gotta tell you, I've I appreciate everyone popping on this thing and spending this last couple of hours for us. I'm, and, and I realize how valuable your, your time is. I want to first thank all of my participants before we kind of wrap this bad boy up with a couple of things. Lisa, thank you so much. You are awesome. You. Virtual you. fist bump. Um, want to thank Ike Ikoku. Want to thank Dan Whedon. Want to thank uh, Mary Henderson, Nick. F. Nelson, Joshua Miller, Frank Mengert. Thank our partners, Bomb Bomb. Guys, listen, we have some partners of this event that are offering some free stuff for you. Okay. So if you go to bomb bomb uh, dot business and bourbon dot live, uh, you can get a 14 day trial of their software, which is the software that I use to send tons of video to do marketing and sales. Um, it's invaluable to me. Um, also, Webinar Jam, one of our, our partners, Webinar Jam. You take all of these names and just add the dot business and bourbon dot live. You go to that, you'll get a 14 day trial of their webinar software, which is super awesome. I love it. Um, next, Steva, thank you. And thank you, Catherine, for, for hopping on. Uh, Uncle Nearest, Uncle Nearest. Uh, fantastic, fantastic whiskey. We've got another whiskey that we've got another bottle that we're giving away from, uh, from them. Um, we have guys, I've got, we, we've kind of run out of time, but I've got probably a dozen things sitting here to give away. So I'm still going to give those away. My team will do raffles. After we wrap this bad boy, you'll get an email, you'll get a message in the business and bourbon network. Um, as well, alerting you that you have won something. All you got to do is tell us your address and we'll ship it on out to you. Um, one last thing be before we wrap, I really want to talk about um, just to make sure you guys are aware of what's going on. So here in June, I am going to run the very first sales chump training camp. And here's, here's why I'm doing this. I'm seeing a major, a massive focus on marketing on LinkedIn, right? Everyone's putting out content. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people are putting out content. And a lot of people are thinking about putting out content, right? So we're thinking about that marketing piece, but who's selling anything? I, I, I just got to level with you guys. A lot of the people that you're looking at that get tremendous numbers on, on these platforms, you think are converting it and they are not. They're, they're not getting sales. They're not actually converting. And there's some reasons 
There are some reasons, there's some tricks, there's some reasons, but they're not converting any of that into actual cells. So what we I've decided to do with this training camp is bring together, we're probably gonna limit it to about 10 folks, we'll be entrepreneurs and sales professionals with a focus on how do we sell on this platform and off. So it's a mix of, I've wanted to do a peer led group for a long time. So a lot of my work is with individuals, but I wanted to do a peer group where we can bring a peer group in. I can coach that peer group on some of the strategies that I'm teaching my entrepreneurs, but then we can lean on each other. We can get feedback from each other. We can see what's working with, with each of us and we can refine our processes. So you get me, but beyond that, you get a great peer group. So, so right now I'm accepting applications for that because I want to make sure that we have the right people for it. And when I say the right people, I'm not talking, everyone that's, that's on this platform is watching, you guys are all awesome. But I want to make sure that you get the most value out of the training camp by having people that are at that same sort of, they're at the same um, uh, place in the path that you are. Right. And so we're all in that same place and we're all growing and we're all evolving together. So that's what it's about. Um, you can go to trainingcamp.ronellrichards.com uh, to fill out an application for that and, and be part of that bad boy. Um, again, want to thank you guys so much for being part of this. Uh, please tell your friends. If you had a good time, tell your friends. Make a post. I appreciate it. Share it on LinkedIn. Share it on Facebook. Share it on whatever. If you didn't have a good time, like I say on all the podcasts, have another drink. You'll feel better. Have, I'm going to have a couple. Before we wrap, hey, I want my team to come back here. You guys need to see who's behind the scenes. Everyone come back here and get on this camera real quick so everyone can see. Because I, you guys need to know that it's not just I get to look pretty on the camera, but it's these wonderful people here that have held it down. Get in here, Jamal. This is the team that produced the Business of Bourbon Global. All right, guys, we will see you the next time and hopefully we'll be in your city as soon as this pandemic, this pandemic clears up. All right, see you guys. Drive home safe. You don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. <laughs>